Hello and welcome to bonus round number two, also known as give the people what they want. In bonus round one, I showed you that we added notifications to the site and I said, you know, just let me know if you want to see the backend code and virtually every comment in YouTube was like, show us the backend code. Now. Okay, all right, well far be it from me to prevent you from seeing the code you wish to see. At the moment, the code is not on GitHub, but who knows, by the time this goes out, it may well be. I just needed to do a bit of tidy up and just generally look through it and just make sure there's, you know, nothing in there. Like, there's, I'm sure you can imagine, there's things like uh, OAuth secrets and stuff like that for actual uh, authentication. So I just need to make sure that none of that's actually gonna go out uh, unexpectedly. Um, so it might just take me a little bit longer to just get through that because I do actually have a, a bunch of stuff on at the moment. <laughs> there you go. Excuses come as standard. Right, let's look at some code since that's what we're all here for. Um, that's a really good little motion. Um, right, okay. So the thing about the server side of sending push notifications, there's two parts that you need to sort of think of. Firstly, there's uh, the, the master um, and then there's the workers. Uh, probably in correct terminology, I'd call them slaves, but there we go. I'm calling them workers. So you can see on screen, I have the uh, the index that the thing is actually going to run, uh, first of all. And it uses Node's cluster uh, module, which is really helpful in this situation. And what it does is the first process, the first node process to run this code will be considered the master. And so I assign it the uh, the role of master. And then the uh, everybody else is assigned the role of worker. And you'll see what that means in a moment. So basically, I require in whichever role you've been given, and then I tell that one to init. So both of these modules, the master and worker, both have an init, so I can just call it, and it'll be fine. So let's look at master first of all. Master is uh, has uh, really kind of two jobs. One is to spin up uh, an express server so that there's an admin interface, uh, which looks like, let me show you that, looks like this. Uh, and you can see that we've got all the, the various sessions. And then there's the generic, I want to send an event update. So it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it'll do the job just fine and dandy. So it spins that up as an express server. And the other thing it does is it maintains a list of all the messages that need to be sent. So in the back end, when we click on the button, and I'll show you the code for this in a moment, when we click on the button that says, okay, tell everybody the keynote's starting. It puts the uh, this here, actually you can see this NQ here, uh, pushes the task onto the task list and it will wake up the workers to go and actually do that work. And we'll come back to that in but a moment. So most of this is uh, not that exciting perhaps. Let me just hang on, where, where's, where's a good place to add it? The init, the init that I called, it creates the workers as needed, which we'll have a look at in a moment, and it also init's the server. So. The create workers as needed function is here. And I basically look through the number of existing workers, which at the start will be zero. And then I figure out the total worker count minus the number that we've already got. So if the worker count is right up at the top and it's based on the number of CPUs available. That means that if I say you have a machine with eight cores, uh, I take one off the length. So I basically assign one CPU to being the master and running the express server, and then the remaining seven would go to running workers. If I had 32 cores, or 32 CPUs, it would be 31 for, uh, for the workers, and one, again, for the, uh, the process, the master. And I, I default it to four. So there's uh, even if I have a machine with one CPU, I'm just going to run four uh, workers and then one, so at least a minimum of five node processes. Uh, so that's how that works. Let's have a look at the server code because there isn't, I mean, a, most of it's sort of uh, what you'd expect. It's kind of uh, standard express stuff. Although, what I do right at the start, where are you? I actually load the sessions JSON from the site and I pass that through to the, the admin renderer uh, in order to actually, uh, where, are you? where are you, where are you, in the admin section to actually render the admin. So I get the sessions and then I, I render the, the admin section with that. And then that just that's just handlebars, just stepping through those objects. All works just fine. 
when we actually send a, uh, a message, let me go into the, the code for that. This is in the subscriptions area. Yeah, we are. It's, the, it's ping and it takes the keys, which uh, is done here. Uh, yep, yeah. I'm using the web push library, which we'll link to in the notes. I said that in the last episode and I don't think we did, but I think we will this time. I'm using the web push uh, library from Node and you can ask it to generate Vapid keys. Vapid is the cross browser uh, encryption keys that you need if you're going to send a payload to devices. And it means that you can deal with uh, uh, Google Cloud uh, endpoints if your subscribers are using Chrome or uh, a Mozilla endpoint if they're using Firefox. And Vapid is the cross browser way of, of you know, uh, encrypting your payload. And so you want something really that generates Vapid keys for you because doing encryption on your own is not that much fun. And this does it for me so I can create Vapid keys. And the other thing you'll see around the code here is there's this DS, which is the data store. I'm using a Google Cloud data store to store all the keys and the subscriptions and everything else. You could just as well use MySQL. You could just as well use MongoDB, whatever backend data store you, would make sense. In my case, I'm, I'm running on Google Cloud, so why not use that? Makes perfect sense, and it's it's very convenient for me. So, when we do a ping, uh, we've already got the keys because I generate those once at the start, and uh, I store those in the data store so that I'm not generating new keys every time. You want to have the same keys. Keys. The ID is the uh, the the, the it's the slug, the dev summit slash schedule slash keynote, blah, blah, blah. Uh, because when we're in the back end, we can sort of send to, you know, the, the, say, for example, those people. And so the, the ID, that target, if you like, is those. The message that we want to send will be the same thing. It'll actually mostly likely be the slug. Or it could be, if it's the general send an event update, it'll just be some free text or some emoji or whatever it needs to be. And then uh, there's a link back to the master. So I do a kind of dependency injection. When I init the server, you'll notice here, I pass in a reference to master here so that it can it can ping back. OK, so for argument's sake, let's say we've got 1,000 endpoints registered OK, uh, across a whole range of sessions. This retrieval filters them down by those who just want to, say, get the keynote or just get Jake's session on the future of service worker stuff. Uh, so we filter those down. And we get back a bunch of endpoints. And for each of those endpoints, as I mentioned earlier, there is an uh, NQ function in the master. And we pass through both the keys, the endpoint, and subscription and the actual message that we want to send. And then in my case, I also log the number of uh, people or the number of endpoints that we've pinged. So it can, we can see in the back end, oh, this one definitely went to like 300 people, or it went to however many people. I don't know how many it's going to be. Uh, right, so the master NQ, I mentioned it before. It put, All it does is it pushes the task onto an array. So the master has this global. Uh, array of messages that need to be sent. It steps through all the workers that were created and it pings them. It just sends this ping message which will cause them to wake up. And then there's a bit of, again, there's a bit of logging for me just to kind of go, the job started. Uh, yeah. Right. Now we get to talk about the workers. They're on the other side of this. So our, our, as I said, our master is, it's got two jobs one is to maintain this this queue and when we send we just basically we populate this queue so we let's say um, we had a thousand endpoints a hundred people wanted the keynote so we'll fill this array and it'll have a hundred entries in it at this point and we ping the workers to wake to wake up the on message is where that then kicks in and if it gets a ping and it is sleeping it wakes up and we call process dot next uh, next tick process dot next tick which is kind of like um, set immediate or set timeout zero, but it's a bit, it's proper, neat and tidy. It's not set uh, set timeout zero. It's actually a, like the, there's a, it's the proper node way of doing it is the best way to say it. And they've optimized. It's not just like set timeout zero. It's properly done apparently uh, to call this request task. So the request task, where are you, is up here. 
all that does is it calls this send function, which you can see uh, basically posts back to the master and says, I want a task, please. So the, the master has woken them up. Each of the workers is going to come back to the master and say, I want a task, please, which you can see down here on the on worker message. If they say, I want a task, please, uh, we pop one off the end. So you, strictly speaking, might want to unshift and take the front of the queue. I don't. I just pop the back off the queue. I'm hoping it, it you know, doesn't matter, really. Ultimately, the queue will get depleted one way or another. And it sends that back to the worker. It says, here's a task for you. One task, off you go and do it. So the worker will, when it's got a task, oh yeah, you see, if there is no task for it to do, the queue's empty, the worker goes back to sleep. Okay, and we'll wait for the next ping before it tries again. But assuming it gets given a task, it sets the vapid keys that it had from way back when, and there's also a URL that you give it. The I, I default the TTL to 30 minutes. If for some reason uh, the message, uh, is, you know, like a session is about 30 minutes, I think. I don't think we've got any more than 30 minutes. If for some reason you don't pick up that message in 30 minutes, it doesn't feel right to be like, hey, the keynote's starting now, if the keynote's no longer running. So I'm hoping that that will just mean that the, the message will expire and we don't over notify and bug people uh, when they don't need to be bothered. And then we call the send notification, which is again, a convenience method on the on that library, which is brilliant. And you give it the subscription, which will contain the endpoint and the key, some more keys, the message that you want it to send. And if there's any issues at all, I just kill the worker. And there is a in the master, if a worker is killed, there we are on exit. Um, on disconnect, it will come back and it will try and recreate any any workers. So say, for example, for whatever reason, we had eight workers and four of them were killed, then we would create four new ones here to kind of replenish and always bring us back up to the correct number. So it's, it's good and uh, that works just fine as well. So what else do we need to show you or do I need to show you in the worker? So hopefully based, yes, hopefully at this point we've managed to send a notification and then we go back and ask for another task. So as each worker is getting to the end of its task, it goes back to the master and says, have you got any more work for me? Eventually that queue will be depleted and the worker will say, oh, I've got nothing. I will go to sleep and it will then wait until it gets the ping from the master saying, oh, there's a new job for everybody, let's get through this. Now, I like this approach uh, because of the fact that I get to control the number of workers. Uh, if I decide to deploy something with 32 cores or 16 cores or eight cores or four cores, it means that I get to decide how many workers there are and how, uh, you know, well, there'll always be one for the, the master process. But this for me is good because if I feel like this is going to be bursty, I could be like, okay, just spin up a load of workers and just they can churn through the queue. They can go at the same time concurrently or parallelize. They're different things. They are, and I forget the difference in definition. Meh. But they run at the same time. And we're splitting the work out. And that's, that's under my control as to how many of those there are. I can just have one and have as many as I need, and that means it, it works out really well for me. So there you go, that is the, the backend code. It is in JavaScript. For those of you wondering why it's in JavaScript and not in Python, uh, there's, so the, for legacy reasons, the site is in Python, uh, as in it's always been in Python since I first did it four years ago, three years ago, I don't know, I guess three years ago. And it's just always been in Python and that's not a big deal, but this I wanted to keep separate. I wanted it on its own separate thing as a separate almost service that I can spin up and spin down for Chrome Dev Summit independently of the site. So it felt wrong to me to have something that is both serving the site and handling notifications because if pushing notifications, if it sort of becomes CPU intensive for whatever reason, I didn't want to jeopardize the site serving in that process. So it felt like it just kept them separate and that all uh, works out well for me. And the other main thing, and it is not insignificant, is that the web push library for Node is really good. It's incredibly convenient 
and it does the things you need. It generates the keys, it will encrypt a message for you, and it will send it to the endpoint. The three things you really need it to do are the three things it will do just perfectly. So the fact that it's a well-tested, robust library for actually doing the push messaging, combined with the fact that things like Express are really nice as well, just meant it was a very easy fit to do all this bit in JavaScript. Cool. I hope by this point the code is on GitHub. Uh, if it is, you'll be able to find it. Probably there'll be a link in the description below. Brilliant. Who knows if there'll be another bonus round? I don't know. It depends on how much more I get done before Chrome Dev Summit itself. Speaking of which, don't forget that you can subscribe to the channel. And as the live stream goes live, you'll get that notification. You can get actual notifications. We have talked about this before. I don't know if you know. But you can get those on the site. So if you want to subscribe to a particular session, um, I don't have any sessions this year. But if I did, you could subscribe to that. But you could subscribe to someone like Jake's. He's got a session, and I I have it on good authority that it's going to be another good one from him. But they're all going to be good, so you should subscribe to all of them. Good. Right. Thank you very much for joining me once again. Take it easy, and I'll catch you maybe in another one of these.